Thank you so much, Romeo. I appreciate it. Thank you, Emily, and everybody else, Christine, for having me here. It's it's always a pleasure to be uh, uh, with Abor. I was uh, there last year in Austin uh, at the Roundup, and then I was supposed to be here this year for the Roundup, but obviously, uh, with uh, what we're going through, that was put off. So I'm really excited that I was able uh, to do this today, and they asked me to come in. I just got to say, I'm looking at the screen, and boy, it really is so disappointing when you see the picture that's been posted. That's the um, you know, that's the, uh, the, 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 the airbrushed professional photo of who you're expecting to talk to. And then the screen pops up and I come in live and this is what you get. This is, this is me after, you know, two months of quarantine, of eating my, my uh, body weight and gummy bears every day. Uh, so uh, let me go because I want to uh, make sure we get through uh, what we're, uh, we're going to talk about today. Um, so he, he told you a little bit about me, my experience. I've been running a brokerage for about 20 years. Um, and uh, my, my company goes back about 20 years before that. Uh, but my background before I got into real estate was I was a teacher. I was a law professor. I was a lawyer for a while. And when I got into real estate, I started to get into the teaching side of it. And I did what a lot of other people did, a lot of trainers did. I kind of immersed myself in the real estate training um, uh, curriculum that was out there, which goes back like 75 years, 80 years to the door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman of the 1920s. And it was all this sort of hardcore sales stuff that you're all familiar with, the cold calling and the, the scripts and all the, the, the manipulative stuff that you use to try to get appointments and then try to get people to sign contracts. So I started to try to teach that. But my experience working with actual agents every day was that very few of them could actually do it. Um, they just couldn't take to it. They didn't like what people did it to them. So they didn't like doing it to other people. Uh, and then on top of that, what I also discovered, which was even worse, was the fact that my top agents weren't really doing that stuff. I would, I would watch what my top agents, my most productive agents were doing, and they weren't really doing cold calling and they weren't really using scripts. They were just really good at what they did. Um, and, and, and they were good at working with people. Like what, what, you know, was trying to find something they all had in common. They didn't all look the same, they didn't all act the same. Some were extroverted, some were introverted. Um, some were people, people, and some weren't. Uh, what they had in common was very simple. They were really good at their jobs. They were really good at working with buyers and sellers. They were competent. Um, and that sort of made sense to me, right? Because like in every other walk of life, you generally feel like the people that do well are people that are good at their jobs. Like the good lawyers get a lot of business. The good doctors get a lot of business. The good hairstylists and electricians and plumbers and virtually everybody in any kind of professional service industry, they do well when they are good at what they do that no matter what kind of marketing you do and what kind of prospecting you do, if you're not actually good at the job, you're not going to sustain success in this business. You know, if you're not good at, at marketing a listing and staging a listing and getting it, so you're not going to get them sold, even if you prospect and get them. And if you're not good at reading a buyer and figuring out what a buyer wants and all that, you're not going to get your buyers to stay loyal to you. Um, and if you're not good at holding deals together, if you're not good at, at the transactional part of the business, your deals are going to fall apart. You're not going to make any money. So the bottom line is if you're good at this business, if you're a successful real estate agent, you tend to be really good at your job. If you just look at the list of people in Abor who are really successful, what you'll probably find is that you would trust them with a referral. You would trust them with your friends um, if they were working with them because you'd say, you know what, they're going to do a good job. They, they compete with you, but they're good at what they do. And you would recognize that. Um, and that's really interesting because it kind of goes against what we've all been taught about how to be successful in this business that we've all been taught. It's all about selling yourself and about being extroverted and learning all these scripts and things like that. And I think there's a difference. There's something that people miss, which is there's a difference between marketing and selling. And they're both important, but they're different. Marketing is about telling your story. It's about saying what you're about. And that's what you do in your advertising and marketing is what you do on Facebook. It's what you do with social media, Instagram and all that. And you're advertising your billboards and all that stuff. That's more telling your story. That's telling people about you. And that's being persuasive and being selling yourself. But sales is something different. Sales is not about telling your story. Sales is about finding out theirs. The best salespeople in the world, I'm convinced, are people that are really good at identifying the needs other people have that reading other people's needs because that's how they sell they sit with somebody and they 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 look at them and they are authentically interested in them 
and they identify what is it this person needs? What does this person need? How can I help them? And once they know what the person needs, they can conform what they sell to those needs. They can pitch their service or their product to what the consumer actually needs. But the first step is actually finding it out, which is why it's so crazy that our whole industry has taught agents that the best way to present themselves, the best way to convert a prospect to a client is using these scripts and, and making a presentation as if it's a show, a dance, a song and dance that you're gonna put on, that you're, you're, you're presenting, you're, you're speaking at somebody as opposed to listening. Because to me, what we need to do more of is we need to do more listening. We need to be paying attention to what our clients say about us and, and what they say about themselves, what they say about what they need. Um, and, and basically that's how I started to develop this concept called client-oriented real estate, client-oriented real estate or core, C-O-R-E. And the idea is that, um, the idea is, well, let me get my screen back. Hold on, there we go. Um, that core is about the idea that you're gonna focus on other people's needs, not your own need. That you're going to think about what they need, not what you need. That this industry for a long time, we think of it as being broker centric. And then about 30, 40 years ago, it became agent centric, but we're still treating it like it's an agent centric business, that it's agent oriented, which is just not true. It's for the last 20 years or so, consumers have gotten so much more power than they used to. And, and I think that this is a consumer oriented business. This is a business that you have to be focused on the needs of the consumer, that we should stop focusing on our own needs and start focusing on theirs. Um, and that's really what, that's what client oriented real estate about. And that's what, um, uh, that's what I think this whole industry and being successful in sales is about. And it starts with this. It starts with thinking expansively about what people need and then creatively about how to give it to them. So let's go to part one. How do we identify needs? What we're going to do is we're going to do two parts. We're going to focus on some of the lessons from my book, how to be a great real estate agent, my second book, which is all about how agents can follow this, this core philosophy of focusing on what other people need and how to give it to them. And we're going to talk specifically about how do we identify the needs of people. So a very small part of the book, we're going to blow it up and talk about it in some depth about how do you identify what people need? Because then in the second part, we're going to turn to our particular environment here, our situation here in the pandemic and in the age of the coronavirus, how the needs of our clients are changing, how consumer needs are changing, given what we're seeing out there in the world. And like, like they said, I, I mean, I'm in New York where we have been at the, the base of this. I mean, this has been um, the epicenter of this crisis. And so we're seeing how those needs are changing. And, and I'm sure you're seeing it in your environment and everybody across the country, what is changing about consumer needs and how do we adapt to that? Because we have to be focused on them and their needs are changing. We have to change with them. So let's talk about the first part is we got to think expansively about what people need. Um, what do they need? What do they want from us? You can't be locked into thinking about what consumers needed 10 years ago. Can't be thinking about what you need. You have to think about what they need. And, and what I put up here on the slide is something that you've probably all seen, which is the, the pitch for the free CMA. And the reason I put it up there is that it, it's an object lesson in how you can screw up in trying to identify what a consumer needs. And here's what I mean by that. For years, agents put, call me for a free CMA, contact me for a complimentary market analysis. That was in ads, that was in their business card, it was in their billboards, it would be in their email signature. It was something that virtually every agent in the country offered, and some of them marketed it very aggressively. And the idea was that, well, you're gonna tell people it's a free market analysis, because the idea is that once they bring you in for the free market analysis, you're gonna do your listing presentation. And at the end of the listing presentation, you do the pricing analysis. So you're gonna give them the answer to their question, but only if they sit through your listing presentation, because you think that if they're really that curious about what their home is worth, they might be thinking of selling. So what we did is, what was interesting about this was that we identified what people needed. We knew what they needed. They wanted to know what their home was worth, but rather than just service the need, rather than just answer the question, what we did was we turned it into a marketing opportunity. We turned it into a sales opportunity because we were very sales oriented. We're very agent oriented in that way. We weren't thinking about the client. You know, it wasn't as if the client called us and said, hey, you say you offer a free market analysis. Can you tell me how much my home is worth? And we would say, oh, where is it? How many bedrooms, how many baths? Yeah, it's worth 350. We wouldn't do that. Rather, we made them sit through our listing presentation to get the answer, all right? So the idea was 
We knew what people needed, but rather than service the need, we turned it into a sales opportunity, tried to manipulate them into giving us a listing. And what happened? Well, Zillow happened. Zillow happened. Zillow created this estimate 15 years ago, answering the question. They said, well, there's a need that people have. They want to know how much their home is worth. Let's tell them. And they built a whole website around just answering this simple primal need that homeowners had to know what their home was worth. And, you know, this estimate wasn't great. It's still not great. It's not as good as an agent evaluation. But you know what? They didn't have to sit through a 45-minute presentation to get it. They click a button. They get the answer to their question about how much their home is worth. And they can find out. And I'm not even sure Zillow, when they came up with this estimate, had a really good idea how they were going to monetize it. They just figured, you know, let's build a website. Let's service people's needs. Let's have people come to the website. Let's build a clientele. Let's build a following. Let's build an audience. And then once we have an audience, we'll figure out how to make money. And they figured out how to make money. They may make money from us, from the agents, from the brokers. It's an, it's a, it's an opportunity lost. It was a chance we had to service the needs of our clients, but rather than did that, rather than do that, we turned it into an opportunity to try to get sales and it, Somebody came out from under us and built a $10 billion company. Now, this is not to blame them. Very smart. Zillow people are very smart. I don't blame them. They, did a, they made a very good business move. I blame us for not being more responsive to what our clients need. And, and we do this. It's not just us. We, we do this all the time. Like It used to be we were the people that you called when you needed a contractor. But we never really made it clear to people that we were open to that. And we were happy to take those calls and we wanted those calls and we wanted them to call us whenever they need something because we didn't get paid for that. So we never really pushed it. And what happens? Angie's List happens. Home Advisor happens. Now we're no longer the go-to resource for those kinds of recommendations. And I think something about our relationship with our clients has been lost because of that. The point is you got to think expansively about what people need. Think about how some of the best companies in the world have done this. Think about how um, like McDonald's um, has, um, uh, uh, McDonald's uh, 60 years ago invented the concept of fast food. Fast food didn't exist before McDonald's. McDonald's thought, well, gosh, you know what people need? A lot of women working outside the home after the war. They don't have time to make a dinner. What if we created a system where they, they could pick up a hot, dependable, consistent dinner they could bring home that the kids would like? You know, Think about what Apple has done identifying what people need. They've done it like multiple times. They have figured out something people needed before they even knew it. You know, we all knew, who knew that we needed one of these, right? An iPad. You know, when it first came out, people made fun of it. They said, it's just a big iPhone. They said, who needs a big iPhone? Turns out everybody needs a big iPhone. We all have tablets now. They invented a category by thinking about what people needed before people even knew that, all right? And I would say, on behalf of the real estate industry, in defense of the real estate industry, 20 years ago, we recognized that people needed the inventory on the internet accessible to all consumers. And even though we were taking a risk, and even though we were worried that if we put the inventory on the internet, eight people wouldn't need agents anymore, turned out not to be true, turned out to be an unfounded concern. We did something I think was really good for the consumer that was really focused on client needs. Clients love the idea of being able to look at inventory on their own on the computer. It doesn't mean they don't need us anymore, they need us for a million things, but it was a way of servicing their need. So we did it and that was a good thing, all right? So we gotta think expansively. How do we think expansively? There's three ways we're gonna think expansively. One, we're gonna talk less and listen more. Second, we're gonna create systems that anticipate their needs. And three, we're gonna adapt and pay attention as those needs change. Let's talk about the first one. Talk less, listen more. The idea about identifying people's needs is that you have to be adaptable to what they need and think about what they, you have to listen to them, all right? Too often we're talking when we should be listening. Like the listing presentation I referred to before. We go into the listing presentation and we have a script that we're reading to them, right? That's what we're taught to do. It's crazy that we're taught, that we've ever taught people that they should sit down in a listing presentation and issue a script and talk about themselves. How do, who does that? Nobody does that. You go to see the doctor. Does the doctor read a script to you? You go to see, does the doctor have like a whole song dance? The doctor sh show you pictures of themselves with their happy patients? No. You go see a lawyer. Does the lawyer ask you questions about what you're doing? Or does the lawyer, um, uh, does the lawyer 
uh, ask you about you? Does the lawyer say to you, uh, what can I do for you? How can I help you? That's what lawyers do. That's what doctors do. That's what financial professionals do. When I went to go meet with a financial professional, a money manager for the first time in my life, I was shocked. He didn't try to sell services to me at all. All he did was ask me questions about myself. He asked me what my interests were. He asked me what I was concerned about, what my fears were, what my dreams were, my goals. When did I want to retire? What did I want to do when I retire? All those things. That's what he asked me about. And the fact was, the more I talked to him, the more I trusted him, the more I liked him. Because the very act of confiding in him brought trust, brought rapport. Because we all know the best way to establish rapport with people is not necessarily to talk about yourself. Everybody's been on a date with somebody who all they did was talk about themselves. Was that engaging? Was that interesting? Was that something that made you want to go out with them a second time? No, the way you act on a date is that you ask people questions about themselves. You show an authentic, sincere interest in them. And that's what they like. That's how you build rapport. That's how you build rapport with somebody. That's how you build trust with somebody. That's how you build credibility with somebody. And yet we've been teaching agents for years to go in like they're selling custom blinds, um, that they should go do a presentation. They should do a song and dance. And it's so hard. It's so much work doing that. It's so much easier to go in and say to somebody, how can I help you? And until you ask them that question, how can I help you? What do you need? What makes you different? How can my services solve the problems that you have? Until you do that, how do you know? I mean, this idea that, well, I don't need, I know what their problem is. They got to sell their house. Yeah, but you know, every seller is different. Every seller has different interests. Every seller has different concerns. Every seller has different um, uh, needs, you know, fears. You can't say that every seller is the same. You know exactly what they want. You don't know exactly what they want. We've been taught to talk too much. We got to talk less. We have to listen more. We got to focus on what our client needs are more than, more than what we can do that, oh, well, what they need is to sell their house. What they need is to buy us. Yeah, that's what we need. We need them to sell their house. We need them to buy us because that's when we get paid. But too often we focus, we're so narrowly focused on that that we don't think about their more holistic, broad needs that they have. And we certainly, if we define ourselves as helping people buy or sell a home, because that's when we get paid, then we never really think about what the needs that somebody might have who is not buying or selling a home, i.e., how much is my home worth? I need an architect. I need a plumber. Like those are the kinds of needs we don't get paid for. But if all we're doing is thinking about narrowly about, well, we define someone's needs as the need to sell, the need to transact, because that's when we get paid. Well, then we're going to completely ignore all these needs that are about relationship building. When someone calls you and they need a plumber and you help them, that's relationship building. That's establishing the kind of trust that will bring you a listing, not necessarily today, but five years from now. That's what we have to do more in this industry. We have to listen to what our clients say. I'll give you an example. This is what all successful people do. Successful people listen to their clients and listen for their needs. I just heard uh, a few months ago at a conference, uh, a guy named Will Goddard, he's a restaurateur in Manhattan. He was giving this great talk about what he does and how his focus is so intensely on the, uh, the needs of his client, and, uh, the needs of his customers and um, hospitality, how to take great care of them. And he was talking to me, he told this great story about how he, was, he, was, he, he often walks along the floor and listens to conversations to see if there are things that he can pick up. And he happened to listen in on this conversation as he went and refilled water or whatever else that this group of like six people was having at a table. And they, had, they were visiting Manhattan and they'd been in Manhattan for about a week and they were eating out every, it was like a, it was a gastronomy tour, okay? They were eating out every afternoon, every night at a different restaurant to like have the full taste of Manhattan. So he's listening to that. And one of them happens to say to the other, you know, the only meal, this is our last meal. We're hopping on the plane later on today. And he says, you know, our last meal, but you know, we never got to have, I really wanted to have a dirty water hot dog. And I never got to have a dirty water hot dog. Now, you know what a, a dirty water hot dog is. A dirty water hot dog is those hot dogs on the stand they, uh, they, with the umbrella that you see on the street, cor street corners of Manhattan. And so Will Goddard hears this. And he goes back and he sends somebody downstairs to find the nearest hot dog cart to buy a bunch of dirty water hot dogs 
and he has them brought up to the restaurant where he gets them plated and does a little elevation of the dirty water hot dog to be in keeping with his restaurant sensibility. And he has them served to this group of people. And they were blown away. I mean, they didn't even tell him that. He just overheard them. But, but he was responsive to what they needed. And that's amazing to be that focused on what your clients need. But we miss it sometimes. Sometimes we just don't pay attention. I'll tell you a story about a broker I know, really smart broker, really good broker, who years ago, 10 years ago, during the downturn, after the financial crisis, he had to close some space. He had to close some offices or cut them. In, he had a big office. It was like 10,000 square feet. And he was trying to cut it to like 2,500 square feet. And he had a ton of agents there. And he was going to have to get rid of all of the private desks that he had in the, in the office. And everything was going to have to be shared desks, except for a small section that he would leave as private desks. So he went to the agents. He said, listen, we're going to have to downsize this office. And we're going to have to get rid of some of the private desks. But if you're willing to give up a private desk, I'll give you a 5% bump and split. All right, for giving up your desk. And he made that offer to everybody in the, in the office who qualified for a private desk. And he thought about 20% of the agents, what he budgeted for is about 20% of the agents would take him up on it. And you know what happened? 80% of the agents took him up on it. And he was shocked because all he'd heard for years and all he thought for years was that his agents really valued having that private desk. Not anymore. Not as much as they used to. They valued a 5% bump and split more than the private desk. And he didn't even know, and he would not have known if he had not asked them that. And he was more than happy to downsize the office and give them a bump and split. It saved him money. It saved them money. The only loser was the landlord. Who cares about the landlord? You got to pay attention. Years ago, um, when I was in college and law school, I worked every summer as an agent. I, I would try to sell one house every summer, and that was like beer money for the year. All right? And I can remember working with this couple and I'm like 22 and they're probably in their late twenties. And the wife says to me that she doesn't want to buy a house with any stairs. I mean, no stairs. Now in my market, almost every house has stairs. Very few houses don't have stairs. But so she told me that and I wanted to be responsive to what she told me she wanted. So I kept showing her houses without stairs, but like the houses without stairs, hey, there's a lot of them. They're all one levels. They weren't as nice as some of the other houses. Like she clearly, she could have afforded much better. She wasn't happy with what I was showing her until finally I, I, I got from her. Why did she didn't want stairs? And she didn't want stairs because she had a, a mother who at some point in the next 10 years was probably going to come live with her. And the mother had problems with her knees and didn't want to climb stairs. And that's what I realized. It wasn't that they didn't want to have stairs is that they needed a space where the mother could come live where the mother wouldn't have to climb stairs, like either an elevator or they would need a space where the mother could be on one level and have her own in and out and the whole bit. And there were lots of spaces like that. There were a lot more opportunities there were than the houses without any stairs at all. So I found them something because I, because I was smart enough to realize, actually I was dumb enough, a really smart agent would have picked up on it in like 10 minutes. It took me like two weeks of showing her a bunch of houses she hated. But eventually I did clue into it and when I did clue into it, what I was able to do, um, what, is it, what I was able to do was, was find her the right house because I listened to what she had to say. And that's the thing. We got to listen. We got to listen to what our clients are telling us. It's more important than ever to listen to what our clients are telling us. All right. Number two, we got to create systems that anticipate their needs. We got to create systems that anticipate their needs. We we have the ability, we know what people are going to want from us before they do. But too often, we let, the, we let a problem come up, we let a need be revealed, and then we're servicing the need, but we could have taken care of the need in advance. Here's what I mean, Bill. I'll tell you a story about the Disney Way, a book by a guy named Bill Capodai. Lovely man, by the way, lovely man. I had a conversation with him about this story I'm going to tell you um, so I could confirm it with him. And he tells a story. He wrote a book called The Disney Way. And the book, The Disney Way, is about how Disney operates things, how it executes things. And it's, you know, Disney has this wonderful way of, if you've been to a Disneyland, Disney World Park, you know what I'm talking about. Just things work right. So he wrote a whole book about their operational approach to things. It's a really smart book. It's a really good book. So after he writes the book, he happens to run into someone who's a fan of his and tells him how much he loves the book. Guys like, guy's name is George. And uh, George runs uh, manufacturing plants in the Midwest. And George says, I love your book. I bought a million copies. I bought it for my whole team. We created a whole task force. We got t-shirts and hats made up. We got posters made up. We built a slogan around it. We changed our whole business. And Bill asked him, what was the slogan? And the guy says, George says, the slogan is, 
at our company, we clean the windows as soon as they get dirty. That's the slogan. Now, between me and you, that's not a bad slogan. I mean, it's a little clunky, but I'd be very happy if every one of my agents that works with me um, and anyone I ever worked with as a consumer took as their mantra, we're going to clean the windows as soon as they get dirty. If there's a problem, we fix it. If something's going wrong, we address it right away. We don't let it fester. We don't let it sit around. We go, we fix it, we take care of it. All right? But Bill Capitai looks at him and says, ah, your slogan. I hate to tell you this. I'm really happy you like the book, but I hate to tell you this. You missed the point of the book. You missed the point of the Disney way. And the guy's shocked. I read the book like 15 times. How did I miss it? And Bill Capitai says, your slogan. Your slogan is, we clean the windows as soon as they get dirty. That's not the right approach. The approach that the Disney way says is the windows never get dirty. At Disney, the windows never get dirty. In other words, you create systems that eliminate the possibility of there being problems. You create systems that, that predict when problems are gonna come up and you fix them. So he uses as an example, when I talked to him, he said, yeah, back before there were those, you know, the, 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 the newfangled light bulbs that last forever, they used to replace all the light bulbs at Disney at about 75% of their, um, of their estimated uh, duration. So if they were supposed to last for 10,000 hours, they would change them out at 7,500 hours. Why? Because they never wanted you to see a light out at Disney. So they took out perfectly good light bulbs and got rid of them because they wanted always to have a light bulb up. That is creating systems that anticipate needs. At Starbucks, they were supposed to do a sweep. Well, now they don't do it, but back when they had shops that you'd walk into, they're supposed to sweep every 10 to 15 minutes. And a sweep is you go to the counter where people get the creamer and the sugar. And you make sure that all the sugars, every, every bin is filled with all the sugars people need. And the canister of creamer is full. And if it's half full, you replace it with a full canister or you refill it. In other words, nobody should ever come to the, to the station and it's dirty. They should never come to the station and you're out of sugar in the raw. They should never come to the station and you're out of creamer. All right. You fix the problem before it comes up. You anticipate your client needs. And it's not just about problems. It's about doing cool things like... I talked to a guy at the Ritz Carlton about six months ago. He told me this great story about how they had a roof deck at one of their properties. And it used to get hot on the roof deck. And at about noontime, they started getting lots of, they would always get lots of requests for water, ice water. People up there, they're getting parched. They want some ice water. And it wasn't necessarily a big money maker because ice water, you don't make any money on ice water. But they saw an opportunity to make their clients happy to anticipate their needs. So at about 11.45, they put a routine in. And the routine was that somebody would go and fill up a pitcher of water and then some sliced cucumbers in because you can't just bring around a pitcher of water to people staying paying eight hundred dollars a night to stay at the ritz carlton there's got to be cucumbers in the water because the cucumbers make it fancy right so they brings the cucumber water walks around the cucumber water and everybody's like oh he's just starting to feel thirsty thank you the cucumber water is awesome thank you so much for the cucumber water people didn't quite get thirsty they didn't have to ask yet for the water they got it before they had to ask that's what you do that's that's creating magic. Anticipating what people need is like magic. Like my phone. I remember maybe it was about eight, nine years ago that, that Apple came out with Siri, right? And it was really, it was, it was, I remember being at a conference with some friends and one of the guys had just gotten a phone. It was like the week it came out. He got the phone that had Siri. None of us had ever seen Siri before. And we gathered around Siri and what did we do? We start asking Siri a bunch of stupid questions. Siri, what's the meaning of life? Siri, do you like me? Siri, uh, how do I be happy? Things like that. And Siri gave us a bunch of dumb answers, funny answers. And we were roaring, we were laughing our heads off. And it occurred to me that at some point previously, a bunch of Apple engineers sat in a basement somewhere, probably drunk, and came up with fun answers to the kinds of questions they anticipated people would ask Siri. So when people ask Siri silly questions, they got delightful answers rather than just simply, you know, oh, I don't know the answer to that, which would be boring and not fun. And Apple wanted it to be fun. Create systems that anticipate what people need. All right, number three, you got to pay attention as those needs change. You have to adapt to the changing needs. We all know the story of how Blockbuster gave way to Netflix. What you may not know is the story of how George Atkinson originally founded the video station. That until George Atkinson came along, there was no such thing as video rentals. He invented video rentals in the late 70s. He invented the, invented the video rental club in the late 70s, 
which then lets all the mom and pop shops that saw that there was a need for people to rent movies they could watch in their home. And then Blockbuster saw the need, but said we can do it better by giving it bigger shops and more selection. And Blockbuster was number one. Blockbuster was huge. We, rem we remember Blockbuster as a failure. It became like a $10 billion company overnight. It was on every block. Make it a Blockbuster night. Blockbuster owned Friday night. Blockbuster was one of the most successful companies in the history of companies. Until it wasn't. Because what happened was they lost sight as needs changed. They lost sight of the fact that consumers hated late fees, hated the fundamental way that Blockbuster made money. And then Netflix came along with a subscription service where you could get DVDs delivered in the mail, always have three of them handy, send one back when you watch it, never have to go to the store, never have to pay late fees. And Netflix did a better job servicing the needs because they paid attention to the consumer needs as they changed. And then the reason Netflix is such a smart company is those needs continue to change and Netflix continue to change with it. There are people on this call that don't even realize that Netflix used to be a DVD subscription service because all they know about it if they're young enough is they know Netflix as a streaming service. And soon people are gonna stop thinking of Netflix as a streaming service and think of it like HBO where it's a content delivery service because Netflix keeps moving to where the puck's going to be, not where the puck is. They keep thinking about the needs uh, that are changing. As, as, as the needs change, Netflix changes with them. As people change, we have to change our services. We have to change our approach, which brings us, of course, to the coronavirus, part two. Consumer needs are changing. What our customers and clients want from us now is different from what they wanted from us just three months ago. We have to adapt to those changes. You know, it's funny, I've been, see, I've been watching, I've watched what's going on in this industry and I'm seeing so many trainers that all I've ever heard from them for years is, you know, all the different scripts about manipulating people and being about sales and you're gonna be a sales monster and stuff like that. And now they're all talking about how you have to do check-ins with your client. You have to, you know, show that you care about them. You're authentically interesting because authenticity is very important. You know, like you can fake authenticity. And it drives me crazy because I've been saying this for years that the most important thing we can do is be paying attention to our client needs and that's how we'll be successful. And I think that, that approach is more important now than it ever has been before because the needs that our clients have are changing and we have to be proactive in changing with them. What's the biggest need? Well, it's the change in the need to feel safe. People are right now, no matter where you are, I know there's a certain polarization that's taking place. The fact is there's there, most people they're afraid of this virus and they don't want to catch it. And sometimes they're willing to make sacrifices uh, because they're so scared of the economic situation. They're willing to take certain risks, but for the most part, people don't want to catch this and they don't want to take any unnecessary risks if it means they're going to catch it, which means your sellers are going to need reassurances that you're watching out for them and you're making sure that no one is going to come into their house and bring something unwanted with them. And your buyers are gonna want reassurances that you're not gonna put them in any kind of dangerous situation, that you're gonna be respectful of them and their needs. Which means certain practices are gonna go out of fashion. Like, you're not gonna drive around buyers in your car anymore. If you were doing that, you're not doing that anymore. For a long time, they're gonna be in their car, you're gonna be in your car, you're gonna practice distancing with them. I think the days of like buyers showing up with, you know, five people at a showing, they brought the kids, they brought the in-laws, they brought the neighbor, they brought everybody to go see this house. I think that's over. I think it's gonna be decision makers only. I don't think they're gonna see the house five times before they make an offer. I think they're gonna to have to be quicker on the draw than that. I think that we might be seeing the end of unsupervised showings where listing agents aren't present because it may be that the, the seller in order to feel safe is gonna to wanna to know that the listing agent was there to monitor the situation, make sure the buyer didn't go rummaging through things or do anything untoward. I think we're gonna see the end of the, of, the, of the public open houses. I don't think those are, right now everybody's doing these virtual open houses and they're great and they're easy. You can do them in 15 minutes to half an hour on Facebook Live or wherever and you're done. And you can do like, if you wanna do, you can do like five of them in an afternoon where you just have to do one and you can reach more people than you did by doing the one sitting for three hours in someone's house. Why would we go back to doing live open houses? The people that are coming to the live open houses, they weren't, we did them because we wanted to give buyers who were not ready to commit to an agent 
and we're, we just want to dip their toe in the water. We want to give them an opportunity to see houses. Well, that's what virtual open houses do. Here's a chance for you to get a look at the house. You don't have to even leave your house to do it. Those are going to be, and I think we're going to get creative with them. There's opportunities now for great agents to do all sorts of things with those virtual showings, with those virtual open houses um, that uh, they don't have to do them on Sunday afternoon. Why don't you do them like whenever you want to do them? Um, but there's lots of opportunities for us to express concern, authentic concern for our clients' well-being. Um, I put a little package here. We, we, we're looking at doing this. This is someone's mock-up they sent me about when we take a listing, we get a box. The box is branded. You don't brand the masks and stuff. You brand the box. You, you get something, and probably nicer than this box. But you get some, maybe a basket, um, and you give it to the seller, and you say, listen, if people show up without personal protective equipment, they show up without PPE, here are masks and gloves and wipes or gel that you have available for them. Now, for the most part, I think buyers are going to come with that stuff. You know, I don't know how much it's going to, I don't think you need a hundred copy, hundred pairs of gloves. So it's going to be relatively affordable to do this for all your sellers. But I think it's a great gesture for your sellers if you supply them with this stuff to keep them safe, to keep them safe. Um, I think you have to have the same thing for your buyers where you're going to need to have, um, the kind of, uh, you're going to have to have a stash of PPE for them. So if they show up to do a showing and they don't have gloves, you put the glo you give them the gloves uh, to put on them. Uh, I think there are going to be requirements. One of the things that we're seeing with our sellers is we're giving them the option that they don't show the property. They don't even let showings for anyone who's not serious. And by serious, it means that that buyer provided a prequal from a reputable bank. That buyer has already done a drive-by to see the property from the outside and to get a sense of the neighborhood. And that buyer has already done the, either looked at the video that has already been provided, or they've done a virtual tour with their own agent. They've looked through the house. What, why? Because I'm not going to show the house just anybody. I'm not going to open up my house just anybody coming in. They got to prove that they're serious about it. Now, we're in the kind of market, and I think you are too, with a limited number of listings, so you can get away with this. I think if we get to the kind of market where, like, it's a buyer's market, uh, people might start, but hopefully by then, uh, we'll be through the difficult part of this process. But for right now, if sellers are, have a little bit of like market power, well then I'm gonna make people jump through hoops they wanna see the house. I'm not gonna let them just walk through. They're not gonna see 20 houses. They're not gonna see my house just sort of narrow down their preferences. They should see my house that they've already driven by and they've done the virtual tour and they've shown they're pre-qualified that if they see my house, they're doing a, they're seeing it to disqualify. It. That if they don't see anything they don't like, they're gonna buy my house. That should be the approach. And I think there's lots of opportunities for that. I mean, if you're not totally committed to digital uh, transactions, you have to be, no one wants to fill out paperwork with their pen. No one wants to touch your paper. Everything should be signed on your iPad, signed on your phone, signed digitally, all that kind of stuff. We've got to move there. We were already going there, but now we've got to go there uh, even more than we were. We've got to be there. Um, we've got to be completely 100% digital. Number two, we have to, there's a change in consumer needs and comfort levels with regard to communication. We've all seen that. I mean, I have done more Zoom conference calls and in the last two months than I did my whole life. And you're probably the same way, that we are so much more comfortable with this format than we ever were before. And so are our clients, so is everybody. Everybody's become so much more conversant with this technology than they used to be. Most people have. but. And, and there's enormous opportunities for us there. First of all, you may have clients who are not yet comfortable with this, where your service to them can be helping them get comfortable. Let me show you how we can communicate so much better on Zoom than we can on calls, all right? Let me show you how we can do it. Let me go do a tour of the house for you on, on Google Hangout for you, so you can stay home and I'll show you the house and you can get a sense of what it's like to use this technology, particularly if you have older clients who haven't used it before. You could be the person that educates them about it. But here's the thing about video stuff, video conferencing. I think it's gonna change a lot of what we do in our industry. Because for example, our industry has always been terrible at the buyer consultation. When we go sit down with a seller and we're doing a listing, we will have a preparation, we have materials, we, we dedicate an hour to sit with them, to talk them through the process, the whole bit. Even though most of our listing presentations are terrible because we yap all the time, at least we are committed to doing something for our client, all right? With buyers though, it's like we meet them at the house or we spend three minutes with them and they don't want to meet with us. Well, to me, where, where Zoom and Google Hangout and all this kind of stuff comes into play is that it becomes so much easier to say to a buyer, listen, 
Before we go out, let's spend five minutes on a Zoom. Here is my Zoom link for my private room, or here's my Google Hangout link. Come, let's talk. At least you can meet and, and look at each other. You know, it's certainly a security issue as well, but just the idea of like being able to make eye contact with somebody, right? Makes a difference in your comfort level working with them. And it makes a big, think about like what lead conversion could be like. You get an internet lead, you've got a text message, you're texting them and you say, listen, let's talk. You text them the link to your Zoom room. They open it up, they go into the Zoom and now you're talking in person. Now you can share your screen, show them other listings, things like that. You can engage them in so much more of a meaningful way than you could on phone. There's just so much we're going to be able to do, I think, with video conferencing that we weren't able to do uh, before. And, you know, two-step listing consultations, being able to do your sphere calls instead of calling or texting them, uh, doing regular um, uh, sphere uh, meetings with them, regular, you know, video conference meetings with them. Number three, the need for virtual experiences, that virtual experiences have become part of people's lives. They're going to museums virtually. They're watching concerts virtually. They're doing conferences. They're doing training like you're doing. Um, virtually. And I think there's opportunities if you can be good at this. We talked before about the virtual open houses. Why not do it? Make it a thing. You do virtual open houses at happy hour, 4.30, 5 o'clock. You do an open house every day for a week for 15 minutes, half an hour. It's so much less of a commitment. It, it's so much easier than spending three or four hours on your Sunday afternoon locked into one place. The technology is changing, should change our industry. The needs of our clients are changing. They don't need, they don't want you to spend three hours in their house. They don't want to be, uh, they don't want to go in 30 people walking around the house with them. It's a better system. It's more responsive to their needs. Um, and you got to learn new skills to be responsive to that. You have to learn skills that we never needed before um, to service those clients' needs. Also, we're going to see a change in housing needs. People need different things in their homes. We're already seeing in my market, which is a suburban market outside New York City, I think some of it's anecdotal and I'll, I'll wait to see if I get data to back it up. But certainly people are saying things like, I don't want to live in a dense environment anymore. I want more space. They've been cooped. Now, of course, they, they've been cooped up for two months in a 600 square foot apartment with a kid. So, of course, they want to get out when you're in Manhattan. Manhattan's its own, its own animal in that, in that regard. But the fact is people want the ability to be able to, they're going to want some changes. We have to see if we can predict. Great agents are going to predict what are those changes? What are people going to be looking for? Maybe they're going to be looking for more space, different type of space. Maybe they're going to be looking for second home, second homes, not that they have to fly to, but a second home that can double as a place where they can go and run away to if this ever happens again. And even in the interior of the house, what, they're going to want different things. We're already seeing it. They want flex space. People see the advantage of having I mean, space in a house that can be used in different ways. We're certainly going to see the ascendancy of the home office. We've always said, you never give up a bedroom. You might give up a bedroom for a home office. Home offices, I think, are going to be the, everybody thinks they're going to be the, the hottest thing, that if you have a defined space, if you have a really nice home office, people are going to be using that. And I think also, just on a base level, the idea that more people are going to be working from home will change how far out from the city center they're going to want to be able to move because they're not going to be going into the office every day. They might be going to the office once a week, which means instead of that, they're willing to put up with that two hour commute once a week where they wouldn't put up with an hour commute five days a week. All that stuff is going to change, which means you've got to keep an open mind about all of it. And then finally, we're going to, we're seeing a change in what our community needs. One of the, there is no silver lining in this pandemic. Anyone that talks about there being a silver lining, it's like, Listen, 80,000 people are dead. Uh, millions of people have lost their jobs. You don't look for silver lining in those things. But we can say this. What we have seen from our communities has been extraordinary. The, the inspiration of the people who are working um, in healthcare and first responders, even the people who do what we think of as not the glamour jobs, they're doing deliveries and they're working at the supermarket and stuff like that. They inspire us with their dedication, their commitment to what they're doing. They're still working. For those of us who can't work, who are like, I'm not allowed to work, I'm not allowed to leave my house uh, to go to work. Um, we're doing what we can by staying home and we're doing what we can by supporting uh, everybody else with what they do. We've, I've seen in my community people coming together, the nightly bang your pots for first responders, meal trains for hospitals. We have Facebook groups that are dedicated to promoting local restaurants that do uh, uh, curbside takeout. 
to try to keep those restaurants in business. I've been to online telethon fundraisers for nonprofits. Uh, this month, uh, this Saturday, I am walking 13 miles myself from one end of my county to the other, from basically one end all the way to the Hudson River um, uh, to raise money for first responders. That people are doing this kind of stuff. And that's, we are realtors, right? We live off the land. We, we depend on thriving communities. Our product are the, are the communities that we service. We need those communities to be vibrant. We need our downtowns to be vibrant. If you have a downtown in Austin, you guys got a million little beautiful downtown areas. You got to support those businesses. I'm in the process right now of trying to create a, um, a database of all the local businesses in my village, in my area, so we can start building, um, we can start talking to them about how they can get some funding, uh, where they can apply to grants. We're going to talk to them. Some of them don't have websites. We want to help them build websites so they can sell online uh, rather than be so reliant on people walking down and doing retail sales. That's what we need to do as a community. And as realtors, we have to lead the way. That's what realtors should do. We have always been stewards of our community. We have always been leaders in our community. And now more than ever, our communities need us. And you know what? Yes, it's good for business, it's all, but it's good, not necessarily good for business in the sense that, ooh, people will see me walking across the county and they'll give me a listing. No, I mean, it's good for business that if I can help make this county a better place to live in, it's better for my business generally. That's what we all need to do. All right, finish up this last point I wanna make for you. It's just this, being great at your job means focusing on what other people need, all right? And that's what makes you great at your job, but you know what, it also makes you a better person. I've been practicing this philosophy for like 15 years. I've been promoting it for the last 15 years to my agents, to people around the country, et cetera, et cetera. It has made me a better person. It has made me a better colleague. It's made me a better husband, a better father. It's made me a better citizen, all right? Because my, my focus, my, 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 res my reflexive response to a situation is, what do these people need? How can I help them? What can I do for them? And does it always pay off? Not in any particular instance, I don't know. But overall, by being a better person, I think it does bring me more success, all right? And so that's what I wish for you. This is just the best example, what we're going through right now with the coronavirus, is just the best example how we need to be laser focused on what other people need, how those needs are changing. We have to listen to them and we have to adapt to those changing needs and find out what they need and then be creative in the way we give it to them. And that's what I wish for you. And that's what I'd like you to take away from today's talk. Thank you for having me. I know, um, let, me, let me see if I can stop the share now. If I, I had problems stopping the share before. There we go. There I stopped. Now I see what the problem was. Um, and I know we have some questions and I know uh, some people want to come in. So let me, Christine, I know you want to come in and, uh, and bring them to me. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. This has been insightful. Um, we do have a question that has come in. Um, could you reply um, or talk to the live open houses in your market and how are they being handled? Are they going away completely? Talk to that a little bit. Uh, we're right now in my market, uh, we don't have them. We're not allowed to do them. You can't do, we're not allowed to do showings in, in New York. New Jersey, we can do showings, but they're discouraged, but they can only be uh, two people or three people. You can have like a couple, you can take them look, but no public open houses. So we're not even doing live open houses. But I will tell you this, in the last couple of weeks, if we started to emerge from like, we were really in a cocoon for like a month and a half. Last two weeks as a company, we've started to emerge. And I've been spending more of my time on my daily call with my agents, more time talking about building business than I was talking about how they can get unemployment and PPP loans, which is what I spent most of April talking to them about, helping them through that process, focusing on what they needed because what they needed in April was they needed money um, because they weren't able to show houses. Um, now we're focusing more on the stuff like, how do we do these virtual open houses? But I'll tell you, the response I've gotten from the agents has been that they, they love the virtual version of these more than live versions that I, I think, I don't think that they're going to go back on a, on a widespread basis. I just think that they'll do a lot more virtual than they will live because the virtual, you get so much more bang for the buck from social media. You, you save the video. Now the video is up there as content forever. And it's a half hour of your time rather than three hours of your time. I just think there's so much more advantages to it and you can do it whenever you want to do it. You can do it. Like I said, during happy hour, bring a drink and have a beer while you're walking around the house. 
So are you finding people that are, are doing any purchasing sight and seen? Yes. That's a couple of the questions that are coming in from the virtual tours. Um, and how are you dealing with this? Um, and also about uh, leasing a property uh, using virtual tour. Are your uh, property management companies using this as, as an option as well? Um, well, what I'll, yeah, everybody's using the virtual tour. Well, nobody in my market can do anything else. It's almost like necessity is the mother of invention. Like, we have had to kind of think about creative ways to do these virtual open houses. So for example, what we do is we schedule, we get them all scheduled. We know who's doing them. They have to register them with us. And then on our company Facebook page, we literally time them out. So we'll go every 15 minutes to a new and we'll promote a new open house every 15 minutes. Hey, we're now sending it off to Jane Smith, who's at one, two, three Ridgeway. And there's somebody whose job it is Sunday afternoon to like quarterback all this and go from Facebook Live to Facebook Live to do it. Um, but the question I got was, are we actually selling houses sight unseen? Yes, we, we, I literally was talking to an agent today and she said, she took a listing, has multiple offers. She has not been in the house yet. She has not been in the house. And she, no one the buyers have been in the house, she's got multiple offers on it. You know, you know, a lot of times you have to see the house, but you know what guys? It's, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, you know that there are houses, you know exactly what you see when you walk in the door. Yes, nobody's closing on a house site unseen. You know, we have a delay between the, uh, you know, when it goes act, when it goes into contract and when it closes. So in that time period, they're finding a way to go see the property, even if it's not technically allowed under the law. Um, but um, like I always say to my, I said to my agents, you know, you are not allowed to show homes. That is the law. And so I'm telling you as your broker, you're not allowed to show homes. But in the same way that if I had teenage kids, I would tell the teenage kids, you are not allowed to have sex. But if you have sex, wear condoms. I always tell the agents, listen, you are not allowed to show homes. But if you show homes, you gotta wear gloves. You gotta wear the, you gotta wear the, the you gotta wear the booties. You have to um, put on a mask. You know, in other words, don't do it. But if you do it, be safe about it. So are they showing homes? Maybe. Are they showing those before they close? I think absolutely. I don't think anyone's actually closing on a home side unseen, but we're getting deals in a contract without people seeing the house live. How do we get pictures of the home before putting it on the market? I see somebody ask. Yes, um, yes, are, that was nice. If you want to know the truth, on the, in the one, case, one hand, um, we sometimes have pictures from prior listings that we're using. Uh, if the property was listed in the last couple of years before it was getting sold, we have those. Sometimes the sellers were coaching the sellers through taking pictures of their own houses. Um, and, um, and the, the really odd part is that, and this is one of the weird oddities of, of being in New York right now, uh, in New Jersey is that photographers have been deemed to be essential. So photographers can now go and take pictures of the houses. We can't go show them, but they can go take pictures of them. So make, figure that out what that means. And how are you promoting your Facebook virtual events is, is one of the questions here. That's probably in your social marketing platform. Yeah, and we start like well in advance. We start pushing the uh, the comprehensive idea that from one to four, there's a multiple number of homes available. We create events for each one of them on Facebook and promote, and the agents are promoting each of the individual uh, events, and they're putting money behind that, um, uh, the advertising campaign. The company's putting advertising behind the global campaign of saying, hey, if you're, if you're home Sunday between one and four, and I think we're going to have to start changing because I think it should be between – Thursday between five and seven, we should start doing these. Or even like Wednesday from 12 to two. People are sitting home on their computers all day, uh, at least in our market. They can certainly, um, they, they don't need, it's not just, every day is the same. I mean, what, what's today? Is today Wednesday, Thursday? I have no mm -hmm. idea. Every day is the mm -hmm. same. Um, I'm home every day. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think they're promoting, we're promoting all the normal, um, uh, we're putting advertising dollars behind it, but we create sort of this, this global event around it where, it's comprised of 30 or 40 different open houses within the event. Yeah, I've got another one offline over here. Um, how do you think that this is gonna impact our iBuyer industry? Um, I, I heard they, they took a time off, they're coming back to it. I, I mean, I think that, listen, I think you learn from your competition. I think you learn from innovation and you, you emulate um, what works and what doesn't work. I, I said two years ago, three years ago, when I wrote Disruptors, Discounters, and Doubters, I have a whole couple pages about iBuyers. And I wrote that like in 19, 2017 about iBuyers. And what I said about iBuyers was that I thought the future was that 
not that there would be iBuyer companies that would be discrete entities, but that every agent would have an iBuyer alternative that you can list your home this way, you can list your home that way. And I think that's where ultimately this is all going. Um, that you know there might be less money in doing it from a from an agent's perspective, but um, but it will be an it will be an option that you'll be able to present because there'll be companies that will cooperate with you about it. Um, how will it affect them? I think what you learn from them is the, what we're learning right now, necessity being the mother, mother of invention, is that we're seeing that people, when push comes to shove, they don't have to see the house 10 times before they buy it. You know, They don't have to go see the house once, then let me go see it again. Oh, and I wanna go now see the basement. And I wanna now take my second cousin to come look at it with me. No, you see it once, you make an offer, you, 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 you make the deal. Um, and I think that that's, uh, so I think that the extent to which the I buyers rely on people, you know, they can go see the house on their own, for example, is something that, I mean, there will be some currency with that because people are going to be disinclined to spend time running around looking at houses with, with, with an agent, with somebody else that they, the idea they can go on their own, just let themselves in, look around, come out and never see anybody else will be appealing in, in some ways to some people. Good, sure. Um, on your online presence, um, have you been getting better results when you're driving traffic to your own website or to Facebook? How is that looking for you? Uh, the individual property pages go back to the Asian websites or the company website, but you know, we've been doing it all on Facebook Live, so we've been trying to live within the Facebook ecosystem of, um, you know, if they want to find information about the property, they're going back to the website, but the event is all where people are. I mean, people are spending all day on social media, um, so we want to be where they are. So we've gotten better results on that, but I'll be honest with you, I've not drilled down to see if we've done like A-B testing of trying it this way versus trying it that way in terms of whether we get better uh, lead capture out of it. Okay, and we have another question here about the photographer you hire. I think um, it's looking to, uh, it says picks to go to the open. Um, Maybe it's about them going into the property. How do they get in? And then what are you doing around the copyright issues if you're using previous photos? You're, I know you said you're using some of the uh, sellers to take photographs for you. How are you uh, doing with the, that? Well, the, the, the seller, the listing agreement, if they take the photographs, the photographs are, they're waiving their rights. So we're not having a problem with that. Um, we, we have not had anybody complain about using prior photographs. Uh, nor have we made complaints or somebody used ours. I think there's a little, I mean, it's not something I would recommend that we do going forward. It's sort of, mm -hmm. it's one of those things we do under urgent situations. And quite honestly, if I got a call from a broker right now saying to me, hey, you know, I saw you listed one, two, three Bluebird Drive and you're using our pictures from six years ago and we have copyright over them. We want you to take them down. I'd be like, really? Like, this is what we're going to worry about today? Like, seriously? I mean, I would take them down, but I would think less of that person for being such a, a ninny about something like that but six months from now or a year from now it's a legitimate it's a legitimate issue i wouldn't say to an agent hey listen you're too lazy to take photos or pay for new photos the the seller uh, listed it three years ago with another company and they got some really good photos use those photos no i would never tell someone to do that but like if the alternative is no photos and you know or you know or maybe calling up the broker and say listen do you mind if i do this the broker's not going to care not in these circumstances we're all we're all sure. trying to pull together in these in these in this kind and of in that same vein, we've got a question around what are you doing for staging the listings? Is it just, it is what it is? <laughs> um, I've been thinking more about staging the listing in our kind of post era, um, and which is where you guys probably are, so it's more relevant to you. I think that, that you need to really counsel people about the fact that you don't even, you've been locked down that house for two months. You don't even notice the crap you have going on in this house. Like right now in my living room, and I've got like, I mean, I, I wore this shirt for you. I just want you to know that I, I would not have a shirt. I'd have, a, I'd have just my t-shirt on, if not for the fact that I felt uh, out of respect for Christine and Emily, I'm gonna wear a shirt with a collar on when I present for you guys. But I have like three shirts. And the reason I'm wearing this shirt, Christine, is that the A-board background that you showed me was blue and I, my other shirt's blue. So I had to change to the red purple shirt for that. And I see it's sort of like blending in with the background here, which is not great. Um, but the, uh, I got shirts hanging. I've got, I mean, this is a green screen behind me. I've got a green screen in the middle of my living room. I mean, this is what people are living with right now, right? So you have to remind them, hey, listen, you want to put the house on the market, you got to undo all that stuff. And if you're still living there, I mean, we're going to be in a situation where people are going to be working from home 
months after their home goes back on the market, which means that whatever room they have repurposed as their home office, we got to say to them, listen, you either have to be versatile enough that you can pull all that stuff out. So when we show it, it looks like a bedroom again, or it's got to look like a really good home office. So when people come in like, Oh, look at this great home office this person set up. Not like my crappy green screen, which is next to my piano behind me. I got a piano right there. So I mean like, there you go. It's a nice room. Yeah. It's a nice room when I'm not taking it over for my zoom conference calling. How'd you like that? Well, we want to thank you reality. so much for your time. Um, I am going to jump over and invite Emily Chenevert, our uh, CEO of ABOR, to give us a few final closing words. And uh, here she is. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, uh, Joe. You, you look great as always. Thank you for putting on a collar. We appreciate it. <laughs> More importantly, the, the information you bring our membership is awesome. And I know that they appreciate hearing from you and hearing from the experience that you've had directly in your market. So thanks a bunch as always. Uh, let me remind you guys that we've got a couple more in this speaker series coming. So we've got on May 21st, Mikey O'Grady with Metro Study is going to give us a rundown on kind of what the economic impact of the shelter in place order was, what we saw shake out at the tail end of the first quarter and then go heading into the summer kind of what we can expect from the market overall. Of course, she has a special expertise in new construction and will be able to also give us a look at what's, what's changing in new construction, how the housing starts are looking and just kind of get you ready to get clients up and running through the summer. Um, also on May 28th, Joe is actually gonna come back around and join us again. He's gonna give us some more broker specific content. Um, he's filled, as you can tell, with really tactical and, and practical advice about how to engage in, in your business. And so we think it's worth it to bring it back around again and can't wait to welcome him again. Um, it, I hope that you guys are enjoying this ABOR on air webinar series. I want to remind you that we're also offering ABOR on air continuing education. That's live virtual education that's managed in a platform like this, but with integrated learning management system that includes your course materials, your testing, a secure way of testing, of a, a checking your address and who you are and all that good stuff so that we comply with the TREC standards. So we hope to see you in some of those classes coming up. Uh, we are opening up the June classes on Friday of this week or Monday of the following week. So just in the next couple of days, remember that your 18 hour CE renewal is brought to you free through your uh, ABOR dues access. So when you pay your ABOR member access fees, you've also paid for the renewal education that's required to keep your license. You can get it through ABOR on air or you can get it through ACIPLE agent on ABOR.com through our relate our, our partnership with Aceable Agent, our online provider. Um, in addition to those 18-hour renewal hours that you can get for free, we're going to open up again more designation courses, more of those elective courses, really trying to be timely in the topics to ensure that the education that we're providing meets your needs as our market continues to pivot through this experience. So with all of that, we guys wish, we all wish you well from ABOR uh, to our membership. So great to virtually see some of you here in the program today and we're looking forward to the next one. So I hope to see you on the 21st. Thanks so much. <laughs>